in uh, September of 2005, I had the distinct honor and privilege of playing the role of Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird when Grand Rapids Civic Theater uh, did that show. Uh, ten years prior to that, I had auditioned for the role and finished second. Uh, and finishing second uh, in an audition, uh, you might as well finish in last place because all you get to do is buy a ticket and go see somebody else perform it. So I was a little reluctant uh, when uh, 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 they said that they were going to do it again. Uh, it was the same director who was going to direct it, and I uh, wasn't sure uh, whether I would be wasting my time and breaking my heart again to audition and not, uh, not get the role. But uh, as luck would have it, I did, and I consider it uh, one of my uh, great uh, honors and privilege. Uh, so I'm always happy to talk about uh, that show and to talk about To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, let me just uh, ask for a show of hands. Uh, is there anybody here who hasn't read the book or seen the uh, movie or, or seen the play? Anyone? Good. Uh, so uh, I don't really have to give any, uh, any background uh, to, to the, the portion of this sh play, uh, which is a very brief portion, uh, that I'm going to do. Uh, which is the, the closing argument uh, in the trial of Tom Robinson. Now, uh, you all have to, uh, to appreciate this. Uh, put yourself back uh, to the 1930s uh, in uh, a very small town uh, in southern Alabama uh, on a very hot day uh, in a society that uh, was in many ways uh, much different than ours, and, and perhaps in some ways uh, not so different at all. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, that's what I'll uh, be doing in that uh, in that venue. With the court's permission. This case is as simple as black and white. To begin with, this case should have never come to trial. The state has not produced one iota of physical evidence that the crime Tom Robinson is charged with ever took place. It has relied instead on the testimony of two witnesses, witnesses whose testimony has not only been called into serious question on cross-examination, but has been flatly contradicted by the defendant. The defendant is not guilty, but someone in this courtroom is. Now, I have nothing but pity in my heart for the chief witness for the state, but my pity does not extend so far as to her putting a man's life at stake, which is what she has done in an effort to get rid of her own guilt. Now, I say guilt, gentlemen, because it was guilt that motivated her. She has committed no crime. She has merely broken a rigid and time-honored code of our society, a code so severe that whoever breaks it is hounded from our midst as being unfit to live with. She is a victim of, of cruel poverty and ignorance. But she knew full well the enormity of her offense. But because her desires was stronger than the code. She persisted in it. She persisted. And her subsequent reaction is something that we have all known at one time or another, something every child has done. She tried to put the evidence of her offense away from her. But in this case, she is no child hiding a stolen toy. In this case, she must not only remove the evidence from her presence, she must destroy it. But what is the evidence? Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson, a, a human being. Tom Robinson, a daily reminder of what she did. And what did she do? She tempted a Negro. She was white, and she tempted a Negro. She was white, and she kissed a black man. Not an old uncle, but a young, strong black man. 
No code mattered to her before she broke it, but it came crashing down on her afterward. Her father saw what happened, and what did he do? There's strong circumstantial evidence in this case that Mayella Ewell was beaten savagely by someone leading almost exclusively with his left. Then Mr. Ewell swore out a warrant, no doubt signing it with his left hand, and Tom Robinson sits before you now, having taken the oath with the only good hand he possesses, his right. So a quiet, respectable Negro man who had the unmitigated temerity to feel sorry for a white woman is on trial for his life. He's had to put his word up against that of his two white accusers. I need not remind you gentlemen of their conduct here in court. Their cynical confidence that you gentlemen would go along with them on the assumption, the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral beings, that all Negro men cannot be trusted around our women, an assumption one associates with minds of their caliber, which is itself a lie as black as Tom Robinson's skin, a lie I do not have to point out to you. You know the truth. Some Negroes lie. Some Negroes are immoral. Some Negro men cannot be trusted around women, black or white. But this is a truth that applies to the whole human race, and to no one particular race of men. One more thing, gentlemen, before I quit. Thomas Jefferson once said that all men are created equal. Now, we know that all men are not created equal. Some men are smarter than others. Some have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money. Some women bake better cakes. Some people are born gifted beyond the scope of, of most men. But in this country, there is one way in which all men are created equal. There's one human institution that makes the, the pauper the, the equal of a Rockefeller, that makes the stupid man the, the equal of an Einstein. And that institution, gentlemen, is a court of law. In this country, our courts are the great levelers, and in them, all men are created equal. Now, I'm no idealist to believe so firmly in the integrity of the courts and the and the jury system. To me, that's no, that's no ideal. It is a living, working reality. But a court is only as sound as its jury. And a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I'm confident that you gentlemen will review with, without passion the evidence that you've heard will come to your decision and will return this defendant to his family. In the name of God, do your duty. In the name of God. Thank you. I um, uh, enjoyed that role immensely uh, for a, a couple of reasons, and I thought that um, when I auditioned that I could do the role, uh, even though I, at the time certainly it was the biggest role, uh, and, and since that time, the biggest role that I've ever, uh, ever had. Uh, and when you have a lead in a, in a show, uh, there's quite a lot of responsibility that, uh, that goes with it. So you have to think long and hard as to whether you have what it takes to, uh, to carry a show uh, or to at least be in a central, uh, a central figure in it. But uh, I felt comfortable with the courtroom scene uh, because uh, of my uh, experience as a lawyer. A lot of people say, well, if you're a lawyer, that must mean that you're a good actor and vice versa. And it really doesn't because they're, they're two uh, greatly uh, different disciplines. Uh, but at least I felt comfortable uh, with the courtroom scene and, and perhaps how to play it. And then, of course, the second thing is uh, Atticus Finch's role as a father. 
uh, with um, uh, him being a widower with two small children, uh, and I felt very comfortable in being able to play that, having uh, raised uh, two boys and now having four grandchildren. Uh, and we were blessed with an absolutely marvelous cast, including the, the, uh, the two people who played my son Jeb, and then the, the role of Scout was double cast, uh, with two lovely young ladies uh, uh, who uh, both brought different, different aspects to the part, but were, were both outstanding. Uh, so it's a, it's a memory that I have, uh, uh, a very fond memory, and um, the, uh, the two little scouts uh, gave me, um, as a memento of that, this pocket watch, which I don't have the opportunity to wear because uh, I don't have any suits with vests. I had to go back to Civic Theater and borrow this. And <laughs> unfortunately, I found out that uh, I was several pounds lighter in 2005. <laughs> so. If uh, it sounded like I was gasping for air, that's the, uh, that's the reason. But this, uh, <laughs> this watch, which has the little uh, logo of To Kill a Mockingbird inside, and it says, To John, our beloved Atticus, 2005. So that's one of my uh, really prized possessions. Another interesting story uh, about uh, being in that show, uh, a week or two afterwards, uh, my wife Marianne and I went out to Pittsburgh to visit uh, our son and his uh, uh, children and his wife. And we went into the, uh, I think it's the Carnegie Museum, I forget the, the full name, but it's a, uh, it's a kind of hands-on uh, children's museum with all sorts of different activities uh, for all ages. And uh, so we're over near the, they have a huge uh, train set, uh, which was drawing my two little grandsons. And uh, over to the right, I noticed that they had a special exhibit uh, on movies. And so I was just kind of casually looking at that, and I looked down, and they had a table with uh, scripts from various movies. And there, uh, in a loose leaf binder attached to this table, but loose leaf with all the pages in plastic sheaves, was Gregory Peck's script from To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and um, uh, for whatever reason, the courtroom scene wasn't in there, but the whole rest of the script was with all of his notations in green ink, red ink, pencil, black ink, uh, regarding uh, the lines, uh, what they meant, what his emotion should be, how to play it. And so um, I, I basically, it was a small table, uh, I remember getting down on my knees uh, and, and reading that script from start to finish uh, to see what he had said. Uh, it would have been nice to have uh, uh, seen that beforehand. Uh, one rule that I have whenever I'm in a play that's been made into a movie is that I don't watch the movie until uh, I'm finished with the play, because if you try to um, see the movie, and particularly that one, if I'd said, well, this is how Gregory Peck did it, and then tried to be Gregory Peck, it would have been an absolute disaster. Uh, but uh, it certainly was a, a, a real thrill to see what he'd written in that, uh, in that script. Um, w one other comment that I'd like to make about uh, Atticus Finch and about the, um, uh, the courtroom scene, uh, I, I think that, that uh, the closing argument uh, certainly uh, can be very powerful. Uh, but as a cross-examiner, uh, Atticus left a little bit to be desired. And perhaps uh, at, at one time we thought maybe even doing that, uh, his cross-examination of Mayella Yule. And uh, you, you may remember it from the movie or from the book, uh, but Atticus uh, thought, uh, naively really, that he was going to get Mayella to confess to what had actually happened, because there was no question uh, that uh, uh, what did happen is what Atticus described in the, uh, in the closing argument. Um, and um, uh, so he had a, a series of questions that he thought was leading to that conclusion, and then, and then basically asked her a question, uh, won't you at long last, won't you, uh, won't you tell the truth? And Mayella's response to that was, uh, uh, I'm telling you fine gentlemen of the jury that uh, 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 that defendant over there uh, took advantage of me. And if you fine gentlemen with all your fancy airs aren't going to do anything, then you're nothing but stinking cowards. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that those of you who've taken trial practice courses here uh, have learned the rule, don't uh, ask an open-ended question on cross-examination or a question you can't control the answer to. Atticus certainly couldn't control that answer, and in the script that just says Atticus shakes his head, uh, wipes off the perspiration, and sits down. Um, and uh, so 
Uh, Atticus, however, had many other redeeming uh, features. Uh, I know that we're here uh, in terms of uh, uh, the community service and ethics and professionalism aspect of your law school education. Um, I, I just want to say that I'm a very firm believer uh, that you have to have balance in your life. Uh, it's very easy uh, as, a, as a practicing lawyer uh, to dedicate yourself to that 24 hours a day. Uh, there is uh, always more work to do, always more work that could be done. Uh, and unfortunately, there are some, uh, some people that I know in the profession uh, who basically spend every waking hour uh, doing that. Uh, not only, I don't, I, I, I'm sure that that's not good uh, for their life as a whole, but more importantly, uh, it's not good uh, in their development as a lawyer. Because I think you have to have balance so that you can appreciate uh, uh, aspects of life. Uh, it, it helps you to understand various things that you're going to encounter in, in a practical way, in a common sense way, working with people in, in all different uh, walks of life. That's one of the reasons that I really enjoy civic theater. Uh, I like lawyers. Uh, I like being with lawyers. I think that they're interesting. I think the work we do is interesting. Uh, and um, so uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a lawyer, uh, but I'm, I'm also aware that uh, many of us have the same kind of way of thinking about things and uh, look at life through uh, somewhat the same prism. When I go over to Civic Theater, I'm working with people from you know, all different walks of life, all different stratas in life, uh, and people who view life entirely uh, differently uh, with, uh, with uh, priorities that are much, much different than mine. And so it's been a very enriching and broadening experience to, be, uh, to have the opportunity uh, to work with them uh, in, a, um, uh, in a cooperative venture. The other thing I like about it is that, uh, uh, as Mike said, I'm, I'm in the litigation arena, and of course everything we do there is adversarial. So everything that I do in my, uh, in my work, I have somebody who's, uh, who's very good, uh, and it's a very good bar in Grand Rapids, uh, they're on the other side, and they're trying to prevent me from doing what it is that I want to accomplish. Uh, so it's uh, uh, that, that kind of environment, uh, you have to enjoy it, I think, to do it, uh, but you have to go into it knowing that that is the kind of environment. I go over across the street to Civic Theater, uh, and as I said, people from all different walks of life, but we're all there uh, working collegially, cooperatively uh, for one end, uh, and that is to put on a show and to make the audience laugh, cry, sigh, swoon, hopefully at the right times, um, and, but we're all doing that working together. <coughs> uh, and uh, so for a change of pace for me, that's a, that, that really is a, a wonderful opportunity. Well, I've been uh, talking here. I'd be happy to answer questions about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, about the show, about uh, my legal practice. Uh, so please feel free to raise any question that might be on your mind. Mike? I'm just curious. You mentioned that you know, acting and being a jury are two separate disciplines, and people always draw that. OK, if you're a litigator, you're probably going to be good at acting. How? How, in your, in your mind, wh how do you see them as different? But then how do you think they, maybe one helps you with the other and the other helps, helps with that? Well, I'll answer that question with a little story. Um, I, was, uh, I was involved in uh, drama in high school, and um, there was a time in my life where that's what I wanted to do. Um, uh, I was uh, actually accepted at Northwestern in their school of speech and drama, but. I uh, didn't have the funds to go there, grew up in Ann Arbor, and ended up going to the University of Michigan, as you indicated. And for some reason, although Michigan now has a very good theater school, I don't think it was quite that good at the time, but I was sort of disappointed that I couldn't go to Northwestern, so I just went down a whole different path. Um, and then many uh, years later, my wife suggested that uh, maybe I would enjoy getting back into the theater, and she noticed that they were offering adult acting classes at Civic Theater, so I went over there and signed up. And uh, one of the things, I think, I believe they still do it uh, in the acting classes there is that they have what amounts to a recital at the end of the class on a Monday night when the theater is dark. Uh, you go uh, on stage uh, with all the other classmates. You've been assigned a scene to do, and you, you do the scene on the, on the big stage at Civic Theater. And uh, the scene I was doing was the, um, 
the scene from Amadeus where Salieri is, uh, is trying to proposition uh, Mozart's wife. Um, and um, so I was with a very lovely young lady uh, who was in the same boat I was, uh, hadn't really done much or hadn't done it for a long time. And so I remember distinctly I had a, a deposition down in, uh, in Kalamazoo that day and I thought, okay, I'll finish up the deposition, I'll get back and uh, just go right over to the theater. And I knew my lines and, uh, you know, this will be a no-brainer and uh, I'll do it and it'll be done with. So I'm, that's, I'm approaching it with that fr frame of mind and all of a sudden it's, you know, we're the third next show uh, scene to come up and uh, we're supposed to go backstage and my heart is racing. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? I, you know, I talk in front of people all the time. Uh, what, what's going on? And uh, it just continued to grow and grow and grow until when we went on stage, I literally wasn't sure if I opened my mouth if anything was going to come out. Uh, I was absolutely terrified. Um, and so uh, I did make it through that. Um, I'm not quite sure what my performance must have been like because we've never seen that young lady in the theater again. Uh, <laughs> And, and she was pretty good, actually. But uh, the, the difference is, as I've, as I've subsequently learned, is that uh, you are, when you're in a role, y you are confined to the, you know, obviously to the words and to the character that has been developed, uh, first by the playwright and then by the director. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's where you have to be. And you have to constantly be in that character and help develop it and so forth. Uh, whereas there is a lot more latitude uh, as, a, as a trial lawyer. Obviously, you have your case and you've prepared it and so forth, but uh, it's just a different uh, uh, kind of thing. Now, the fact that you're comfortable and standing up in front of people, uh, uh, I think, does ultimately uh, uh, pay dividends. But there are, there are a lot of people that uh, I'm, I'm amazed in the, in the theater. There are people that you would meet them on the street in their daily lives and you would say, uh, you know, this is a this person is a wallflower. Uh, there's no way that they would ever do anything in front of other people, and yet uh, when you give them a script and they get on stage, it's just magic. Uh, so uh, they're di they're different disciplines, uh, uh, clearly with some comparable um, attributes required. Any questions about law, legal practice? Uh, I told I, s I mentioned a moment ago that I think that the bar in Grand Rapids is uh, is really an outstanding bar. Uh, I felt that from the day I first started practicing here back in 1973. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that I'm so proud of the uh, the legal profession here is that almost without exception, the people involved give back to the community. Uh, I don't know of uh, of anybody that. Uh, uh, hasn't done something for one organization or another. The organizations run the whole gamut um, uh, from uh, churches to service clubs to various charities of one kind or another to uh, fine arts organizations. Uh, but in almost every case, you'll find one or more lawyers deeply involved in those organizations to help them uh, in their uh, mission and to accomplish uh, what they're trying to, to achieve. Uh, and. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want a board comprised of all lawyers, uh, but certainly to have uh, legal uh, input on a board uh, is, uh, is very important. Yes, sir. Well, I have to kind of plumb my memory here a little bit. Uh, the second show that I was in at Civic Theater was A Few Good Men. And uh, that, of course, is a, is a very uh, compelling courtroom drama. Uh, my part in A Few Good Men uh, was uh, sufficiently large that if in the first uh, 10 minutes you blinked, you would not have uh, known that I was on the stage. Uh, I was the one that in the legal office assigned the case to Lieutenant Caffey and then was heard from no more. Uh, but, um, and, and the people who played uh, those roles, none of them uh, were lawyers uh, and did, the, I, I thought, a, a marvelous job. Um, uh, another uh, show that uh, I'm pushing hard for Civic Theater to do again uh, that's got a legal uh, uh, 
scene um, and, and is involved in a court, is a courtroom drama, is Inherit the Wind. Uh, and that was done several years ago. Again, uh, done very well here, again, by people none of whom were lawyers. Um, and, um, uh, but so far, it's my pleas have fallen on deaf ears uh, to, uh, to bring that back. One of the problems that uh, I see um, with the local theater community here, and with, uh, with civic theater particularly, is uh, as you imagine, it's, uh, it's always sort of a hand-to-mouth operation, and in this economy, it's even worse. And the fact of the matter is, the shows that, uh, that sell are musicals uh, and, you know, family kid shows. So the, uh, uh, the opportunity to do a show like To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, that's a little different because um, so many people read it uh, in school, and so it has that draw. But Inherit the Wind and some of these other uh, his, uh, st straight plays, uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, uh, for those to be done a lot in the future. I'm just hoping that every season there's, there can be at least one uh, play like that. I can't really think of, um, of a... Well, that's what I'm going to say, the drawing of the Oh, I, yeah. Um, you know, I, I definitely was thinking of, of plays, uh, and generally, uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with what, uh, what, what we do see. My wife and I uh, travel a b quite a bit to New York, and we've seen some great shows. Um, nothing is really coming to mind. I, I, I always thought, I don't know how many of you, I'm dating myself a little bit here, uh, but do you remember the, the TV show L.A. Law? Um, one of the lessons that I drew from that is how much uh, information and how persuasive an argument can be made in less than 60 seconds. Because on that show, if you remember, uh, there would usually be three, four, maybe five storylines that would be interweaving during the course of the show, uh, and uh, frequently one of them would end up with some courtroom scene where somebody, Arnie Becker or whoever it was, was making a closing argument. And um, uh, the, uh, it always amazed me that in a maybe 45 second maximum closing argument, they could get the point across and drive it home. Now, one of the problems I have uh, is trying to cut down what it is I'm saying and how many times I make the argument. Uh, and I, that show helped me realize that you really can get it across to people without uh, saying it three or four times. Uh, so I drew some things out of that. Any other uh, questions or comments? Well, I very much appreciated the opportunity to uh, come here today. And uh, I was uh, telling Mike this is the first time that I've been at, in the law school building here. I've uh, seen it from across the street many times. and. Uh, uh, I'm happy to, to be in the building, and uh, it looks like a, a very wonderful facility. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Nelson. And there you have it, uh, uh, an authentic professional of real integrity, uh, uh, playing the mythical role of Agnes Finch, another professional, but uh, again, a mythical one uh, of great integrity. Uh, John, it might interest you to know a couple of things about Cooley and his relationship to the theater. One is that Cooley sponsors every year now, for some years, I believe, the Stages of the Law uh, program in theater uh, in Lansing. And a number of different productions over the years have been done uh, there. With the support of Cooley and, its, uh, and some of its faculty members, too. I don't know if this is true of uh, Professor Faulkner or Professor Carrier, but many of Cooley's faculty members have played in the theater and uh, certainly in choruses and other things as well. Is that true of either of you? Are you theater? Oh, yes. I was at BMR. Okay, there <laughs> we go. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great. Uh, John, it might also interest you to know that Cooley uh, gives out the Raymond Burr Awards uh, to certain of its very special students each term, although not for their acting prowess. Uh, <laughs> for those of you too young to have seen the original shows, or those of you who do not watch the late night reruns, uh, the awards are named after the actor who played the defense lawyer Perry Mason. Uh, that's, that's long before L.A. Law. Right? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, on television. Cooley named the award for Burr, who was later Detective Ironsides, wasn't he? Right? Yeah, remember that? Okay, some of us do. Um, because Burr was the real guest speaker at Cooley for one of his first Founders Days. Uh, yeah, and he did that gratis. Uh, but the story that Justice Brennan, Cooley's founder, tells is that when he invited Raymond Burr, he did sign the letter as Justice Brennan, and he might have been confused for a certain Supreme Court, United States <laughs> Supreme Court <laughs> justice, and Raymond Burr might have accepted for that reason. That's his story to, to tell me. <laughs> David to him. Uh, Burr was, of course, not, not a real lawyer. He was an actor, although he was a good one, winning a couple of Emmy Awards uh, for his Perry Mason work. Uh, Mr. March, though, was both a good actor and a great lawyer, and you've heard a bit of that from, from Mike. Uh, and we do need to distinguish the mythical from the real, don't we? That's, that's an important distinction to make. We are told that the mythical Atticus Finch um, was uh, named after the authentic Roman orator, and this is maybe lore, uh, but uh, named Titus Pomponius Atticus, who was himself remembered for his neutrality. Uh, this uh, Roman was <coughs> both an orator, uh, a, a horseman, an editor, a banker, uh, but not a real lawyer not a real lawyer, um, but his best friend was Cicero, who was antiquity's greatest lawyer. Okay, so maybe the role should have been called uh, Cicero Finch instead of Atticus <laughs> Finch. Does that sound good? <laughs> no, I think Harper Lee probably had yeah, it right. I'll take that up from Harper Lee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think she probably had it right. Uh, like the uh, mythical Perry Mason, the mythical Atticus has had a remarkable impact on a number of, well, actually on the modern legal profession in America and a number of its prominent members. Uh, the mythical uh, Atticus has been criticized by law scholars for his moral ambiguity. I think scholars criticize just about everybody, don't they? <laughs> uh, and really, for not standing against the racism and sexism of the day, but the founder of the Southern Pover Poverty Law Center, Morris Dees, uh, credits the mythical Atticus for the reason that Dees became a lawyer, as an example of uh, Atticus's uh, influence. And, to federal district court judge Richard Match, who presided over the Timothy McVeigh trial, um, admits Atticus's significant influence on his own law career. And the Alabama State Bar even erected a monument for Atticus Finch, the mythical Atticus Finch. So, You know, if I can inter yeah, interject please. just one thought that I, I, I meant to raise. Uh, within the last year or so, uh, Jane Beckering, uh, who is an outstanding lawyer, was an outstanding lawyer. ceremony. And so uh, I, I did, uh, and towards the end, uh, I mentioned that uh, Atticus Finch was a hero of mine, and, uh, and then did just a little bit of the end of that closing of, about Thomas Jefferson and all men created equal. So uh, a little bit of a gamble, because I did it with the accent and so forth. And, uh, but anyways, as I'm coming off, Jane comes up to me and hugs me and says, uh, this is unbelievable because in her acceptance speech, uh, she said that it was Atticus Finch and that, uh, that line, that Thomas Jefferson uh, line from the, uh, uh, from the closing argument that led her to want to be a lawyer. as the American Film Institute's greatest hero of American film. Peck was recognized as the greatest hero, in large part for his portrayal of this role of Atticus. Uh, Peck himself drew inspiration from the mythical Atticus, becoming such a champion of civil rights that he won the Presidential Medal of Freedom Award, right? Uh, and again, not for his acting, uh, but for his advocacy, his authentic advocacy. So you can kind of see that uh, you know, art imitates life, which imitates art, which imitates life, right? You know, the mythical and the real. Uh, but uh, just in conclusion, my hope is that you'll draw inspiration as Harper Lee herself did from the authentic more so than the mythical. She based Atticus, the lore is, on her father, her, her real father, 
Some of you have had fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers who influenced you, who have maybe been your inspiration to come here and to be a lawyer. Hold on to them. Hold on to the real. Hold on to the authentic heroes you have. And then do what the graduate of ours, Mike Lichterman, did. Choose other authentic heroes wisely when he chose John March. Choose, in fact, choose Cindy Faulkner. Choose Professor Batzer and Professor Carey. Choose our Cooley graduate and head of public services, Aletha Hansowitz. Our Cooley graduate and campus deputy director, Joan Rosema David. Other faculty members here. Other local lawyers who, whom we've had come and graciously speak to us about their own work and contribution to the profession. Uh, and then please join us for a light dinner right after Karen Rowlater has a little something for Mr. March. I'm gonna grab, my voice doesn't project as sure. well as yours, so. Um, what I'd like to do is share um, with you, all of you, a little known superstition um, about the theater. And that is if an um, empty theater is left completely in the dark, a ghost light is in evidence. So thus, a small ghost light is left lit on center stage. And that's what this was supposed to represent tonight. And Ghost Light is also the title of a book. And it was written by uh, Frank Rich. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Frank Rich. He was once the all-powerful theater critic for the New York Times. And um, he sent word that tonight's performance was magnificent. <laughs> and, but Mr. March, I, what I'd like, we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation. And I have here the book, Ghost Light. It, it's currently on print, but we were able to get a copy for you. And it's a, it's a memoir, and it tells of the ghost light and how it was a beacon of security for Frank Rich as a child, uh, finding his way in a very tumultuous world. And I thought it would be fitting um, to give to you, since you have tonight here and in the past given guidance and insurance, uh, assurances to our Cooley students as they um, pursue their law degree, because as you know, that can sometimes be real tumultuous. So, well, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, very, that's, very much. that's wonderful.